So yeah, we're going to get a story, well, the power of uh, visual storytelling and transforming data into insights. So come on, Magna. A round of applause, come on. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'll just keep this here. Okay. Only this one, right? Yeah, you can put that Okay, okay, great. Oh, that's perfect. Hi, how are we doing? Am I too loud? No? Okay, great, thank you. So, oh my god, I'm huge, okay. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm Meghna Singh, and I'm a senior consultant in KPMG Ireland. Uh, I work at the Dublin office in the Connected Tech team, and I work in the data analytics and visualization domain. Uh, a little bit about myself. So I am originally from the eastern part of India, um, where, which is a city called Kolkata, uh, better known as Calcutta. I've done my master's in economics from the University of Calcutta. I'm sorry. And uh, before I joined KPMG back in March 2023, I was actually working in Accenture in Bangalore, India. Um, well, that's a little bit about myself. And now, OK, yeah. So that's the agenda of my talk today. So first, I'll go through a brief introduction of what visual storytelling is. So yeah, I, I think I forgot the topic itself. So it's the power of visual storytelling transforming data into insights. So it might be quite similar to what Katie discussed earlier, but I bring in a different perspective, and I promise you that. So just bear with me. So yeah, OK. So now with the agenda, I start off with a brief introduction. Then I move on to discussing the importance and need of visual storytelling, after which I share a few tips and best practices and some other elements which might be good enough to focus on when we work on such projects. And lastly, I would uh, discuss a few challenges and the probable solutions which have actually worked for me uh, in my career. So great, OK, sorry. So I would like to start off with a quick story. So, so this is back in the 1800s, so once upon a time. But this was not actually a pleasant one. So there, were, there was a couple called Mr. and Mrs. Hedges who were living by the side of River Lea in a neighborhood called Bromley by Bow. Apologies for any mispronunciations. So this couple, there was not much known about the couple, except for the fact that they both died of cholera. And in the preceding weeks, this actually created a massive outbreak of cholera in London and it was a huge concern for the people. So there was a man, as you see, Mr. William Farr, who was a doctor and a statistician, who started gathering data just to understand the spread of the disease. And when he did that, it was very difficult for him to actually convince the people that you, know, you could do a lot with this data set. So what he did was, he started, he explained his data points with the help of graphs and charts. And this chart here, it shows the mortality rates of different age groups in different areas. And this dates back to the 1800s, right? There was no Excel, no Power BI, nothing. And he plotted this probably all by hand. So as you see here, one of the regions here is Liverpool, and he actually plotted this out. And when he showed this to the people, they started believing him. That, you know, yeah, there is something wrong, and we can actually do something about this. As a result, so this is the story that I wanted to share. And why did I share this story? So the story actually tells us then that when data is actually put into visuals, it makes more sense to people. People are able to comprehend from that data. So, 
so I'll come straight to the next part, which is the importance of data, of visual storytelling, or data storytelling. We use visuals to enhance the data, right? So why is it important? Why, why do you think visual storytelling is important in today's world? So the first is, there is a lot of data. Starting from the grocery bills, to the expenditure management of households, to the internet data consumption that we have every day, there's, there's actually a lot of information that we capture every day, each one of us. And we don't realize that, to be honest. Now, can I see a show of hands? How many of you got coffee during the break? Oh, great, lovely. I didn't, so sorry. OK. So, so when you got that coffee, that coffee is actually the end product, which is there in your cups. But there's a company who is manufacturing this coffee, who is distributing it to us end users. So there are millions of data points which this company has to go through such that we keep preferring the same coffee every day and every time. right? So what happens is, so this entire data set becomes huge for that company. And that company actually has to match the trends, the preferences. It has to update its packaging, marketing strategies, have new ads, just to be the apple of our eyes at all times, probably. So that, that keeps happening. Now, let's imagine these companies are, are uh, there are people who, who are actually looking after these companies, who are actually deciding things for these companies. They are actually the business heads, the stakeholders, or the investors. So these people, they have very limited time to look at all those millions of rows of data. And what they do is, they actually take a quick glance at a report or a dashboard and make decisions or get into meetings with clients. So when that happens, that actually tells us that if we, if we give them a story, if, if we give them a visual, it is easier for them to take a look at it and go back. Whereas if we just give them big numbers and tell them, you know, this is the number, this is not, it's difficult to remember that. Moving on, the next is the changing trends. So this actually brings me to a very catchy example. So, I say maybe 10 years ago, we were, uh, we, we loved watching the TV. We still do. But our preferences have actually changed a little bit. There's an extravagant surge on the content being consumed from the on-demand streaming platforms, Netflix, Prime Video, and so on. So that has actually changed a lot in the entertainment industry, which actually tells us that the trends are always changing. And in order to be relevant with these trends, it is important for us to be able to upgrade with the help of marketing strategies. So it, it comes to companies, right? So the companies who are making the decisions, they have to make the decisions keeping these things in mind. Now, I'll quickly move on to the need of visual storytelling. So you might say that, OK, let's just present a few graphs, a few bars, and that should be it. Why do we need a story? Why do we need visual storytelling? Avengers fans? Oh, lovely, lovely. OK. So this, I actually took this to my advantage. Uh, because so this scene has made a mark in the Marvel history. When Captain America, you know, takes that hammer. <laughs> okay. So, and, and this actually tells us that when you, see, when you see a visual and when you know the story, it makes it memorable for the people who are watching it or the people who are looking at it. This memory actually helps us to convince the audience that what you're looking at is actually true and you actually have faith in what you're looking at. And the last is, as a result, so these are all interlinked, right? So as a result, 
they engage better with the content that is provided to them. Moving on, I will take you through a few tips which I feel might be useful in our day-to-day -day work when we work as data analytics professionals. So when I generally start developing a dashboard, that is a Power BI dashboard for a client, I follow these steps. The first is data gathering. This is a very important step. Why? Because we need to know what are the different data sets that the client has. There are multiple data sets that the client caters to. Now we need to have all that data with us. We need to understand all that data such that we are able to give them the insights that they want to look at. The next is data cleaning. So this actually takes up a lot of time because uh, none of the data is structured. None of the data is good enough to work on. And I see a few nods, so that's excellent. So what happens is when data is not structured, when you have unnecessary information in the data, you might want to avoid them because that actually brings in a huge file size, which is difficult to store at the end. So data cleaning is something which we have to do before we put the data into the dashboard, into a Power BI dashboard. So the next is data input. This essentially means just connecting the Power BI dashboard to the multiple data sources. And this actually helps us to associate with the client well. Why? Because the client understands that they have multiple data sets. Now the client sees that we actually take that into consideration and we pick out the ones which are important so that they are saved, their time is saved here. Why? Because they actually don't have to do the hard work you know, of finding the correct data sets for us. So we do that part for them. Okay. The last is building insights. This is actually a huge, 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 huge point. But as, as Katie mentioned about wireframing, so that is one of the first steps when we do when we talk about building insights into a dashboard. So wireframing is necessarily a blueprint. It's like a blueprint of the dashboard where we show that you know this is how it's going to look. These are the visuals which might be used. This is how it, it will be designed. So this actually helps us to build the rest of the story because that's the most important part, to be honest. Now, we know how to build a dashboard. We follow a few steps. But then, do we know whether it is good or is it bad? How, we, how do we assess that? So, yeah, so there are a few components. The first is narrative structure. This is essentially the flow of the story. What are the key insights that we are bringing out? Are we using the correct KPIs to bring out, bring out those insights? The next is simplicity, clarity, and relevance. So that essentially means that the story needs to be simple. Too much complexity will just bore everybody. So, so yeah, so that happens. And then clarity, it's just as simple as that. You need to be transparent with your client or stakeholder and tell them that, you know, this is not working out or this is not working out so that they know that where the data is not sufficient or where it is overloading your dashboard. The last is engagement and interactivity. And I'll demo this, uh, not a demonstration as such. It's just a quick example. Yeah. So we all know what this is. Who are these people? What are they doing? And I'm standing in Belfast, so yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's lovely. So, so yeah, so this actually tells us that when a person watches a movie, for example, they actually can relate to it. They actually have an emotional connect with it. So as a result, we, uh, you know, we tend to have the audience's attention at all times. Similarly, with regards to visual storytelling, it is very important to engage the audience and to interact with them. 
oh, so you cannot, so when you present a dashboard, you can't just interact. Oh, how, how, do you, how, how do you find the dashboard? Is it all good? It's not that interaction. It's actually the elements which are used in the dashboard, the buttons, the navigation functionalities, all the different functionalities which a Power BI dashboard can resonate to. Sorry. Okay. So there are other essential elements which are important in a dashboard. The first are the interactive elements, like I talked about. The next is the consistency in the design, color, and font. So this is essentially to build out the dashboard in a form such that it is familiar to the organizational brand that we are producing the dashboard for. So for example, if I build a, uh, if I build a dashboard for KPMG, I would be very sure to use all the colors, exact same fonts, and you know all those very simple things, such that it belongs to the same organizational family of presentations. Now, uh, these points are actually things which people overlook at times, but uh, they make a huge difference. Trust me. So, so next is the relatable content. The content that we present in the dashboard needs to relate with its audience. And I will take you to that in a little more detail in uh, one of my next slides. The last is the look and feel, as I mentioned. The design, it cannot be too bright, like my picture, which I had up in the beginning. So it can't be too bright. It, it needs to be a little subtle. It needs to follow the organizational rules and you know all the standard practices. And it also needs to be well-spaced, properly aligned. So there have to be proper alignment between the visuals, proper spacing, so that nothing is upon something else. So, so yeah, that's the part of other elements. Now, I believe a filmmaker is the best storyteller ever, like ever. So, and, and you might not agree with me and that's fine. But then I take inspiration from this quote by a famous Indian filmmaker, Mr. Shotajit Rai. Uh, you might know him as Satyajit Ray. So he says that the essence of storytelling lies in capturing the human experience. The human experience is what I focused on. And why did I do that? When I present a dashboard which I created to the client, I need to know what they feel about it. I need to know what their feedback is. Because I, as a data analytics professional, I work on that feedback and I present it in a much better way the next time when I probably speak to them. So, and that actually tells the client that, you know, this person cares. This person cares what I see on my dashboard, how I see my dashboard, and how I see my visuals. So that actually, you know, makes me better at my job. So, yeah. Okay. So this part is actually the life cycle of a dashboard. Again, this is not, uh, like, it, it's not... Uh, something which might be always uh, this way, honestly. It depends from project to project and from client to client. This generally happens when an agile framework is put in place. So, uh, and, and if we follow this generally for me, in most of my projects where I've followed this, it has made my work really easy. And you'll know why. So the first is requirements gathering. We talk to the client, we get their specifications, their requirements, and we gather all the data that is required. The next is development. So when I'm, when I'm talking about development, it's about the Power BI dashboard. Like you literally build pages, you build visuals, you build icons and buttons and navigation options and all of that. So when you do that, so I, what I generally like to do is uh, develop a page. So for example, I have a project where I have to develop, uh, develop three pages of Power BI. 
I build the first page, or maybe a little bit of it, and I go back to the client, and I take some feedback from them. Do you think, so I ask them, do you think this looks good? Are you happy with how it is being presented? And if the client says, yes, this is good, I go back and I do the rest. And if the client says, no, I want a few changes here, I go back and do those changes, and then it aligns with the client's requirements. So development and review are actually something which I like to do together, because it helps me, honestly. The next is UAT testing. This is actually the user acceptance testing. What I mean by that is, when I devel uh, develop a Power BI dashboard, I generally, so when I want the client to use the dashboard, I publish it on Power BI service. When I do that, there are multiple people coming into the dashboard just to take a look at it. And these people, they come in from different backgrounds, from different uh, expertise levels, from everywhere, right? So it's important to cater to those people because their feedback also matters. The last is the best part. Everyone is happy signing off the project. The project is over. So, OK. So the last part is, what are the challenges that we face in this field? Um, there are actually a lot of challenges, but I would like to highlight a few which are really important and which are almost present in every project. OK. So the first is overloading. This actually essentially means that data being overloaded so that the file size becomes too large. And that is actually a problem, because nobody can actually use it. Nothing happens with it, and it just stays there, doing nothing. So after that, we have data accuracy. It is important to keep the accurate amount of data in the dashboard. Why? Because if you have more columns, which make no sense, they would just, they would just not make sense to anybody. And if there is, uh, so once you build the dashboard, the data that you're presenting, even that has to be accurate. You cannot just have a wrong calculation, a wrong DAX formula, which just brings in a completely different thing, which makes no sense, right? So the numbers have to be accurate. They have to match with what the client wants to see, because they mostly know what the numbers could be. Um, the last is audience diversity. So as I mentioned earlier, there, there are multiple backgrounds of people coming into the dashboard every day when the dashboard is live. So it is important for us to, uh, to produce the insights in such a way such that it's easily understandable to any person. So I just randomly pick one person from from the street, probably, and tell them, just take a look at this dashboard. Do you, do you know what, what, what it's doing? And that person has to say, that, you know, yeah, this is actually true. It, it, it is working. And when, when I get that validation, I know that my visualization, my story flow, and all of it is correct. Because a novice person understands it, so probably most people would. So. Here are a few references uh, I've added. Uh, again, I have added a Udemy course uh, because this course actually helped me learn Power BI because I had to learn Power BI on the job. I didn't take a course. I didn't do anything. I had to learn it on the job, breaking my head, you know, you know just, just trying to get things right. But then I am glad. I'm so glad that I did that because today, uh, the kind of work that I do be it in KPMG or in my past experiences, I get to learn from it every day. And that's an amazing feeling. So yeah, and that's me on LinkedIn. If you would like, you can send me a message or uh, send me a request, whatever it is. I'm happy with all of that. And yeah, if you have any questions. Great. Oh. All right, settle, settle. Thank you. I can talk gently. And thank you so much, first of all. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yep. Anyone on this side before I 
Okay, because then it can do a loop. I'm, I'm getting there, but just trying to be economic about, about the route. Sorry, who was it here? Oh, yeah, brilliant. Hi, um, great talk. Um, I just had a question about version control. So at the minute I work on a dashboard that is live, but then also has continuous improvement, improvement in mm -hmm. the background. Um, and I'm not a Power BI person, so I'm kind of making it up at the minute. And we have basically one version of the dashboard that we publish as mm -hmm. dev and one as live, and we just hide the pages that are in dev. Do you have a better way of doing that? Is that something you have experience in? Um, to be honest, when there is already a live dashboard, um, it's, it's not advisable to create other versions of it because it just is more confusion for us who are developing, the dash, developing in the dashboard. Mm -hmm. So I would say that is actually the best thing. Even I do the same, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but I also try to save in all the previous versions because mostly what happens is, so ideally, so if probably I'm building a dashboard in, on my desktop and one version of it is live, I have five other versions. So I keep that in my desktop itself such that I can go back to them and I can get things out of them if I require. Because there are situations when the client wants to go back to a previous version and say, you know, let's just do that. So that is actually a very good practice. And as I said, even I follow that. So yeah. Okay, lovely. Thank Does you. that answer your question? Yeah, that was perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right, should we end around? Also, I'm impressed. I don't think I've seen a presentation that ranges from cholera to the Avengers. <laughs> I think that was uh, particularly impressive. Keep everyone in. Sorry, shimmying, shimmying. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk, um, Magna. So my question is um, on one of the challenges um, you mentioned um, as to data storytelling, and it's the very first one where you talked about overloading. I know you initially talked about it um, earlier, where you said you would you would go back to the clients and tell them that you know their data is overloading the dashboard and all. Um, so. Can you please talk more on that and yeah. what you do to um, you know, overcome that challenge? Yeah, you actually reminded me I missed a point. So yeah, so there is a solution to that. And uh, what I think is there is a way to aggregate the data. Uh, you can do it in SQL, you can do it anywhere else, but there's a way to aggregate the data. And what I mean by that is you reduce the granularity of the data. So for example, if you have SKU level, SKU is the uh, so how do I say? So for example, you have a sachet of coffee. So that is the least, um, the least level that the product could be in. So that sachet of coffee, and if you have data on the sachet of coffee, that is the SKU level of information. So you can pull it up to maybe category level or maybe one, one level higher, such that to aggregate all the numbers that are present, this actually shortens the data and makes the input file, um, I mean, less heavy. And this actually helps your dashboard to accommodate the data as well. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? OK, great. Thank you. Great. Any more? No? Oh, sorry. So, uh, so yeah, so for example, I worked on a project where the client was very strict with you know, the granularity level and they actually wanted it at the least level. So what we did then was we broke the dashboard into two parts. So that helps, but sometimes clients don't even uh, actually like that because they want to have everything in one, in one space. So uh, I have just, I have generally broken it down, but otherwise thinking it's a difficult situation in real life because it's very difficult to convince the client that, you know, this granularity is not working and you really need to shorten it. So, um, but sometimes they understand, sometimes they don't. If they don't, I generally break it off and I give them two different versions or two different dashboards, to be honest and probably link the dashboards. Sorry, yeah, so, so probably, so if, if I give them two dashboards, for example, so, um, so when the dashboards are live, 
uh, they actually take a look at a, uh, take a look at one page and then probably they have a button to go to the other dashboard so it's actually when they look at it it acts, it's actually the same dashboard but actually have broken it up so yeah does it answer okay okay thank you nice okay. any more no all right thank you so much thank you thank you um just one second. Oh, I've jumped the gun. Sorry, I just have one last thing to announce. Uh, okay. So, hey! Yeah, so we had this quiz uh, which KPMG, uh, in the KPMG stall outside, and Onika is the winner. Woo! So, <laughs> did I just switch it off? Oh, I'm sorry. That's all fine. Oh. Oh, thank you Woo! so much. Oh, thank oh, you. That's your <laughs> memento. Thank you. Yeah. I never win anything. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well done. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry, I did the last bit. Oh, that's okay. That's fine. Annika, you're bringing that to the after party to share, right? Fine. <laughs>